Greetings and welcome back to room 303 AP English, the world of ideas lectures. We are in unit 7 and we continue the topic faith. And we're now in lecture 43. This is Frederick Nietzsche's Apollonianism and Dionysianism. This one was come from his very first book, The Birth of Tragedy from the Spirit of Music, 1872. We're going to be working with the Francis Goldfling um, uh, translation. Now we are back to another controversial, very controversial thinker of the 19th century who influenced so well the 20th century. You'll remember in earlier lectures at LearnStrong.net that we've already given, we spoke about the power of especially Darwin, Marx, and Freud to influence so much of thinking in the 20th century. To that list of three, we usually do add the great thinker Nietzsche. Very controversial. We've given a number of lectures at LearnStrong.net already, and the assumption is that you've been following that stuff, lectures one through 42, especially lecture 34, when we talked about Ruth Benedict, who takes this very essay and the ideas of this essay and applies it to her study of uh, the uh, Pueblo uh, uh, Native Americans. Um, we also have mentioned Nietzsche a number of other times. Go to our uh, a lecture on uh, Goethe's Faust in uh, LearnStrong.net in the AP folder. And there, at the end of that lecture, we spent some time with the um, God is Dead passage. We made references to the eternal reoccurrence in our lectures on Dante, for example. So Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's an important part of what we've been doing in Room 303 for some time. We also work off of the assumption that you're familiar with our learning theory, the desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways through active reading, our annotative approach, where we are always looking to answer three guiding questions. What does the text say? What does the text mean? How can I relate to this text in some meaningful way? And we'll obviously continue that. I also really do want to challenge you. Try and read this all on your own and then come to work with me here. Let's do some quick biography of Nietzsche. His dates, 1844 to 1900, he dies, of course, the very beginning year of the 20th century, or the last year, if you want to think of it that way, of the 19th century. He is a great critiquer of modernity and the scientific enlightenment. Go back to our lecture on the scientific enlightenment in the senior A folder at LearnStrong.net and the differentiation of the value spheres that defined so well the beginnings of the scientific movement. It was Nietzsche who would then resurrect the serious questions about this scientific enlightenment. Jacobus points out in the introductions to uh, the comments here that uh, one of the important goals for Nietzsche was self-mastery, to that degree sounding very much like Plato, very influenced by Plato, wrote his dissertation on Socrates and satire, and many have argued that Nietzsche was really just rewriting Plato for the 19th and, of course, the 20th century. He lived a very difficult life physiologically, um, health-wise, and, of course, he struggled intellectually as well at the end of his life with some insanity. A brilliant student at the University of Basel and, uh, and had all kinds of interesting uh, relationships with others. For a while, Richard Wagner is, a, uh, um, is, is an important person in his life, but then he and, and, and uh, Wagner fall out in the same way that um, uh, Freud and Carl Jung will fall out you know, at, uh, against each other. And in fact, I'm, I'm with you now on page 642, the birth of tragedy from the spirit of music in 1872 is really a result of the effort to try and clarify certain aspects of the music of Wagner, right? the contemporary composer, for some of the important uh, work that he had done. Just to continue with this idea, the insight on which the birth of tragedy rests presented in the selection reprinted here, is an attempt to clarify the two basic religious forces in humankind, Apollonian intellectual, intellectual uh, uh, behavior and Dionysian passion. The first reflects the thoughtfulness associated with the god Apollo, whose symbols were the bow and the lyre, employing, uh, implying his fierceness as a god of consciousness combined with the love of the arts and music. The second reflects the god Dionysius, a, de a deity associated with vegetation, plentifulness, passion, especially wine. Of course, we're familiar with this because we worked with the Bacchae in our study of Greek theater. Go back and take a look at that in the AP folder as well, right? Uh, both of these, um, Apollo and Dionysius, were, of course, sons of Zeus, and each represented extremes in behavior, whether religious or secular. 
to skip down just a couple of, uh, of lines, the kinds of personal behavior countenanced by these two gods are also quite different. For each god represents an aspect of the larger divinity. The rational qualities of Apollonianism approximate the ideals of Plato and Aristotle, whereas the aesthetic qualities of Dionysianism comes closer to the views of some saints, such as Teresa of Avila, for example. The distinction between these two states of mind is considerable, but both are associated with artistic expression, religious practice throughout the world. Nietzsche relies on art to help him clarify the distinction between each of these Greek gods. Apollo dominates intellectually. He demands clarity, order, reason, calm. He's also the god of the individual. Dionysius, on the other hand, is the god of ecstasy and passion. Obscurity, disorder, irrational behavior, even hysteria are encouraged by Dionysius. He is the god of throngs and mobs. We think of immediately of our study of uh, Arthur Miller's The Crucible, for example. And you can take a look at that lecture on learnstrong.net as well. After reading this excerpt, we can realize that most of us have both capacities within us and that one of life's challenges is learning how to balance them. Put that in your notes, hypercritical. Reading Nietzsche is almost always an activity encouraging some sense of balance. Although, unfortunately, so much of Nietzsche's ideas have not been interpreted, sadly, that way, especially at the reading of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, an important text in 303 as well. Now let's turn to the rhetoric really quickly of Nietzsche, not what he says, but how he says it. And Jacobus has some important insights here with us, uh, for us on page uh, 643 and following. I'm just Because Jacobus does it so well, so brilliantly, I'm just going to read. Nietzsche's task was to explain the polarities, their form of expression and their effect. Since these terms were quite new to most contemporary readers, he took time to clarify the nature of the Apollonian Dionysian. So put it in your notes. Rhetorically, this is a classic example of comparison contrast. So when we have you write a comparison contrast essay, you could obviously use this essay as an example or model, no question. In a sense, to continue Jacobus, the first paragraphs are spent in the task of definition. Each uh, polarity is defined. Nietzsche goes on to explain its sphere of influence, its nature, its implications, and so far as those qualities are present in the rhetoric, this essay is itself Apollonian, right? No question. There is a surprise in Nietzsche's use of rhetoric here, however. Through rhetorical techniques, he also illustrates some aspects of the Dionysian nature. These are passages that, in the selection, um, as, for example, the discussion of Dionysus in paragraph 5, that can best be described as static, poetic, and if not irrational, certainly obscure and difficult to grasp. Um, um, Kaufman, the great translator of Nietzsche, who we're not reading now, but Kaufman, the great translator of Nietzsche, pointed out that his German is just brilliant, poetic. The Dionysian aspects of the passage are based on feeling. We all know that some poems cannot be broken down into other words or even explained to others. We think about, uh, for example, Coleridge's um, Kubla Khan is a classic example, right? What we extract from such poems is not an understanding, but a complex feeling or impression. The same is true of the passages we confront in this essay. They challenge us because we know that the general character of any essay must be Apollonian. When we're greeted by Dionysian verbal excursions, we're thrown off. Yet, that is part of Nietzsche's point. Verbal artifacts, such as Greek tragedy, can combine both forces. And of course, this was one of the great critiques that Nietzsche made of um, the Christian world of his day, was that there's this uh, inability to see the value of both the Apollonian and the Dionysian, as obviously the Greeks saw it, a celebration of the Greeks, and Nietzsche was famous for it. Let's just finish on page 644 before we work level one. Last paragraph. If it can be said that religious faith can be embodied in dramatic art, then it might be said that for the ancients, it was present in the work of the great traditions. For the Elizabethans, it was present, obviously, in Shakespeare. And then, obviously, for Nietzsche's contemporaries, it was Wagner's ring cycle, right? The ultimate effect of using the rhetorical device of comparison contrast is to emphasize the need for these two forces to be unified in the highest cultures. Diversity is everywhere in nature, as Nietzsche implies throughout. But that diversity has one deep longing, to be one with the one, sounding, of course, 
uh, like very much like Emerson. Go back and take a look at our essays um, on Emerson at learnstrong.net. As Nietzsche says in paragraph 14, the eternal goal of the original oneness is its redemption through illusion. Illusion is art, not just dream. Great artists of all ages understood that dream and illusion are the means of art and make accessible the inner nature of humanity. Go back and take a look at our comments on Wordsworth's Ten Turn Abbey and the very idea at the conclusion of that poem that from nature the inspiration is always going to be found. All right, let's work really quickly, level one and the 17 paragraphs. Now, no question, you're probably going to have to read this essay two or three times to really get a sense of what's being said here. Let me see if I can help you. Paragraph one and two. Art, he says, allows its continuous evolution to the Apollonian Dionysian duality. And this duality, this word, makes us immediately think of Plato, makes us immediately think of Lao Tzu, doesn't it, and the yin yang symbol. That is, to both the rational, Apollonian, and irrational Dionysian characters of human nature. In other words, we have both. We possess both. Paragraphs 2, 3. We experience dreams, we think of Freud, don't we, with a sense of delight and necessity, and as well, of course, young. The image of Apollo incorporates the thin line that the dream image may not cross, fearing it may impose itself on us as a crass reality. Paragraphs 4, 5. In the Dionysian rite, the individual forgets himself completely, and of course we would say herself as well, and becoming reconciled with nature experiences a mystic oneness with all creation. We think immediately of Teresa of Avila, don't we? Paragraph 6. Apollonian and Dionysian states, rising directly from nature, are not rendered by the human artist. Thus, every artist seems to be an imitator, either an Apollonian dream artist a Dionysian ecstatic artist, or some combination of both. We think of Shakespeare, obviously, don't we? Seven, paragraph seven. In order to assess the relation of the Greek artist to his art, imitations of nature, we must discover the degree to which the two forces of nature, Apollonian and Dionysian, were developed in the artist. Apollonian, paragraph 8, Ap, uh, Dionysian and Apollonian elements, each enhancing the other in a continuous chain of creations, eventually dominated the Hellenistic or the Greek mind. Paragraphs 9 through 13, from the Iron Age, with its battles of titans and its austere popular philosophy, the Homeric world developed under the aegis of Apollo. Paragraphs 14, and it's interesting that he would say this because, of course, in AP, we talk about the uh, Ulyssian or the Odyssean type of character as set against the uh, Achillean type of character. And you can obviously see some similarities uh, in this paradigm of Apollonian Dionysian. Uh, paragraphs 14 through 16. The naivete of Homeric beauty was absorbed once more by the Dionysian passions. In opposition to the Dionysian power, the Apollonian code rigified into the majesty or Doric art and contemplation. And then finally, paragraph 17, the true end of this artistic evolution was the dramatic Dithrit, a passionate hymn delivered to Dionysius in combination with the tragedy. We think of Orpheus as well, right? This union achieved the common goal of the Apollonian and Dionysian virtues. Well, let's finish quickly now at level 2a. What are we going to say about this in regards to our big five? Epistemologically, what are we working with here? Well, what can we know? The fallibilist position, it's clear here for, uh, for Nietzsche. Nietzsche was the great understander of the importance of hermeneutics or interpretation. And of course, he's going to really force us to have to take the fallibilist position as opposed to the absolutist position in regards to most interpretations of art. Ontologically, what does this text say? Well, who are we? We are a creation of stories. It is from Nietzsche that we will learn. We are the stories that we tell and retell, the stories we accept, and of course, really important, the stories we reject. Go back to our comments on the God is dead passage, the madman passage, right? Uh, the the uh, th third, psychology. Well, obviously, fear has tendencies to paralyze us, but fear is an important element in terms of who we are, right? Sociologically, well, the Apollonian and the Dionysian obviously have to find a way to coexist, both within the individual and within the state, the society. What does this text say about theodicy and the existence of pain and suffering? Well, of course, when it happens, it's, we've got to find a way to balance the, the fear and the pain and, of course, the joy and the ecstasy. And obviously the question is not why did this happen to me, but rather why did this happen for me? Compelling idea. 
to a, well, obviously the goal is harmony, it's balance, right? We need both Apollonian and Dionysian elements in our temperament as well as in our, as, as well as in our school or in our community or our state or our world, right? Uh, that is to say, opposites do attract, and they have to balance each other. At 2B, the rhetoric, obviously, comparison and contrasting here is compelling. Great example of it. At 3A, how can we relate this to other texts we already know? Plato comes to mind immediately. Obviously, Homer, the great plays, uh, as well as the Aristotelian understanding of poetics, all of that, and we'll get to Aristotle's poetics in the final unit of Jacobus, actually. Think about how you can use this idea to relate to everything we've studied from Lao Tzu to Buddha to Christ in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew to the Bhagavad Gita, of course, to Muhammad in the Quran, as well as to Teresa of Avila. It's an amazing thing how this essay works. And, of course, we mentioned as well the Ruth Benedict lecture already. right? I also want to point out our lecture number 24 over Howard Garner's multiple intelligences. Think about how that one plays into this one. Think about Blake's Lamb and Tiger from Songs of Innocence, Songs of Experience. You can go and find those lectures as well at, 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 at learnstrong.net. Of course, in 3B, this is a fun essay to read because it can ask of you, okay, are you more Apollonian or are you more Dionysian? And at what points do you find yourself more Apollonian, more ordered, more structured, more Dionysian, more of the, uh, of the emotional side? And do you think, finally, that it is true that opposites attract? I mean, is, is it true that that's probably the case? Are the best lovers the ones, one is Apollonian, more Apollonian, the other is more Dionysian? I'll let you, I'll let you decide that one. We had to end on love, right? Thank you. I hope you enjoy and want to go and find more of Nietzsche to read.